So let's continue then with our series that we have been in basically since the beginning of the year. And we're now in a sub-series looking at our own identity. For a while we looked at the question, who is God, his characters, his, his character, his attributes, his names, and all these things. And now we look at the question, who am I with Christ, and who am I without Christ? And in the last sermon, we looked at creation and fall. And we looked at the question, how did God create us in the first place? And we looked at different things that we can get straight from the Bible. First of all, God created us with one purpose, to worship him. That's why he created you and me. That's our purpose. That's why we are here. He created us as his children. Every single being in this world was created by God himself. So we are his children. He created us to rule. It was his intention from the very beginning that we would rule and reign together with him in this world. We would have authority here. He created us for good works. He created us not to be lazy or just to enjoy everything. He certainly wants that. But he also wants us to do meaningful work. And it was meant to be joyful, not a burden. He created us for meaningful relationships with one another. He created us for fellowship. He clearly stated in the creation account, it is not good for men or for women. It is not good for people to be alone. He wants us to have meaningful relationships with each other. And he created us to live in safety and security. That place, the Garden of Eden, was perfectly safe. It was perfectly secure for Adam and Eve. That's how he created us, and that's the desires that he put in all of us, including you and me. But then something happened. Adam and Eve sinned. And suddenly, this whole way in which God created us got broken and completely distorted. We were created to worship God, but the very first thing that happened when Adam and Eve sinned was they became fearful of God. They started hiding They didn't want to be in God's presence any longer. So instead of worshiping God, they now wanted to stay away from him. We became children of wrath. We deserve the experience of God's rejection because he is holy and we are not. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death, and not just physical death, but spiritual death, separation from God, is a consequence of our sin. That's who we became because of sin. Now we became slaves instead of rulers. We were meant to rule this world, but our sinful attitudes, our sinful deeds and everything, the Bible says, made us slaves to sin. And we are now caught in our own web, in the consequences of our own sin. And we are not free any longer. Work became a burden. We now have to work. It's no longer that we enjoy working with God. We now have to work as a means of survival. Relationships got separated. What was the first thing Adam and Eve did after they had sinned? They were ashamed in front of each other. And so the meaningful relationships that we were created for now got completely separated. And our safety and security got lost. We were meant to live in a perfect place where God would take care of all our needs. No dangers, no sickness, no nothing. Everything would be perfect. We would feel completely safe and secure. Is this world like this? Not at all. We now face uncertainties, fears, all these things because of our sin. Now, the trouble is we still have these God-given desires. We are created to worship, and we will worship, whether we know it or not. We will worship someone or something. And if we don't worship God, then we will maybe worship ourselves. Maybe we'll worship money. Maybe we'll worship our family, our children, whatever it is. We will worship something. We want to feel secure. We want to do meaningful work, all these things. But because of sin... We don't feel fulfilled any longer. These things don't satisfy any longer. And what then most people do, 
we chase the fulfillment. We run after these things because we hope that somewhere we can find the fulfillment that we are lacking. So we work harder. We make more money, all these things. And we think, then I will feel secure. But we don't. We have empty relationships. And then we think, well, maybe I need more friends. Maybe I need to have more sex. Maybe I have to have this. I have to do that. Just to be disappointed by relationships over and over again. Some people think, well, if I have every possible insurance there is, we are ge- not all of us are Germans, but we are in Germany after all, then we think like if we have all the p- insurances that uh, possibly exist, then I will feel safe. But they don't. We chase after all these things just to realize that emptiness that has been there in the beginning is still there. So that was a quick summary of last time. That was the bad news. God created us in one way, but because of sin, we cannot live in the way that God created us, originally created us for. We cannot live like that any longer. I told you many times, it's not the end of the story. And here is finally the good news. It's Easter Sunday. And if you don't listen to anything else, if you have to leave or whatever, you get a call now and you have to leave, just remember this one thing. Jesus offer to restore every single thing that was broken. And not just in the future, not just that he says, okay, one day in heaven you will get all that again. But he said you can have every single thing that was broken when Adam and Eve started sinning. You can have all of it now. Everything you're looking for. And that's the topic for today. Just a quick reality check. Jesus' death and resurrection which is the basis for everything we'll talk about today, is a historically proven event. Many non-Christians who, make, who do just historic research and just say, like, well, what influence did Jesus have on the world? They look at the historic facts outside the Bible and they come to the conclusion, it happened. Anyone who says it didn't happen, I have, I'm sorry to say this, that person is historically ignorant. There is tons of proof, non-religious proof, outside the Bible that shows that it really happened. Jesus did rise from the dead. Muslims, who are probably one of the most opposed people group in the whole world, who are most opposed to Jesus, they don't deny that Jesus rose from the dead. They just come up with interesting explanations why it happened. But it simply cannot be denied if we look at the facts. So the question is not really... Did Jesus rise from the dead? The question is, why did he do it? And what does that have to do with us today? I grew up in a Christian context. I went to church as a child for a long time. For 25 years of my life, I believe it had happened. I did believe that it was a historic event. I just couldn't make any connection to me. And I had no idea what it meant for me personally and why it was such a big deal that we even have a holiday and all these things that 2,000 years later it's still remembered. I thought there was no connection, and so it wasn't important. But if you ask Jesus himself why he did it and why he died and rose again, he would say, I am God. That's why it happened. And if you think about it logically, either he was trying to deceive everybody, Or he was crazy out of his mind. He was deluded about his own identity. (coughs) Or he is right about himself. And he really is God. There's really no alternative to these three. There's no other possibility. And really everybody needs to come to his or her own conclusion. We cannot force it on anyone. But every single person I think should sooner or later come to the conclusion. I believe he was evil. I believe he was deluded. He was crazy. Or I believe he is God. And once we made our decision, then really deal with the consequences. Because a man who has such an impact on the world's history, we cannot just ignore him. And we need to wrestle with the question, is he really who he says he is? And then deal with the consequences of whatever conclusion we come to. So, what a... If he's really God, what else did he claim? Well, coming back to the topic, 
about our identity. He promised that when he died and when he rose again, he would restore everything. Not just things in the future, but really he would offer to restore everything today. You and I can again live in the way that God intended us to live in the first place, just as if we had never sinned. All we have to do is embrace it, accept it by faith, and saying, Jesus, I believe in you. If we don't do that, we will face the consequences of our sin like everybody else. So much for the introduction. Let's look at the different things in more detail. What did Jesus actually restore? And what did he actually offer us? Well, remember what he created us for in the first place? God created us for worship. We were created with a deep desire within us. I want to worship God. But the problem is that God completely distorted it when Adam and Eve sinned. Genesis 3, 8 to 10 says, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. They were created to worship. Now they were afraid of God. God created them to find complete fulfillment by simply being in his presence, worshiping him, bringing him glory, telling God how great he is. And that would in turn fulfill them too. And now they turned their back on God. That's the problem. That's the problem you and I face too. Without Jesus, we are afraid of God because we know we have nothing to offer him. We cannot measure up with him. We are sinful. And so unless we embrace Jesus by faith, you and I will do exactly what Adam and Eve did. We will run away from God, try to hide from him, and we will not give him the worship that he deserves. But let's look at what Jesus did. This was before the resurrection even. John 4, he spoke with a woman. And she said, Our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you, you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour has come. And now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. Do you see what he's doing? He's saying true worship, bringing glory to God, is being restored. And he didn't say one day in heaven we will worship properly. He's saying the hour is now. Jesus is restoring us to our purpose. As we can see from this woman, she had a total wrong conception of what worship is. She thought, I need to go to a proper place. Uh, I need to do it the right way. And then um, Jesus is saying, "Um, you're worshiping what you don't know. (laughs) So there's a clear distortion between what this woman thought about worship and what worship truly is. And Jesus, in summary, is saying, I am restoring everything. Now that I am here, Jesus, now that I am here, you can worship God the Father again in the way that it was intended in the very first first place. Not in the future, but now. And what will heaven be like? It will be one massive worship center. We will do nothing else. 24-7 will simply give glory to God. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, 
for all nations, tribes, and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood, stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto all God forever and ever. Amen. He's already restoring everything now for us personally, but of course we still live in a broken world. But one day when we reach heaven, worship will be perfected again as one body, as people of God, from all tribes, all nations, all over the world, we will worship God perfectly. Jesus restored everything. Sharing a bit from my own personal experience, if I can think about the moments I felt most fulfilled in my whole life, it's when I worship God. And it's not necessarily with songs. It can be part of it. But sometimes it's simply by being obedient and simply praising him, maybe quietly in my mind or something like this, um, doing something that I know he wants me to do. But it's when I give the glory to God for who he is, when I feel most fulfilled. It doesn't have to be ministry necessarily. This can be in our job, it can be in our workplace, it can be in our family. But when we truly worship God, that's when we find fulfillment. Jesus has already restored it. Let's look at another problem of sin. Sin made us children of wrath. Ephesians 2 says, among whom also we all had our behavior in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. God hates sin. And he's not like we are to one another and being like, okay, yeah, it's fine. Uh, Don't worry about it. He hates sin. He really hates sin. And so when we commit sin, we become children of wrath. We become children of wrath. We also become children of the devil. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, which with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. That's the verse we read in the beginning. We were dead. We were not alive in God. We were dead in sins. John 8, 44, Jesus rebukes the Jewish people at the time, and he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the last of your father you will do. For he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. He is saying, if you don't believe in me, if you don't believe in Jesus, you are a child of the devil. That's who you and I are without Christ. We are children of wrath. We are children of the devil. That's what sin makes us. But thankfully... It's not the end. Romans 8 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, it has nothing to do with gender. It applies to women as well. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, by which we cry, Abba, Father. You see that relationship? We were adopted. Now we call out and we call him our Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him so that we may be also glorified together. By faith in Christ, we are no longer children of wrath. We are no longer children of the devil. Now, we become adopted children of God Again, it's not something I have done in my own strength. It's not something that I can work for. Being adopted doesn't mean that the child works hard to be adopted. Being adopted means that the parent chooses to say, I accept you as my child. 
just as if you were my biological child. And that's exactly what God did to us and to you and to me. Now we are children of God again. First when he created us, then we lost that identity because of sin. Now God restored it through Jesus. That's who we are. Let's look at another problem. Remember, God created us to rule. But that also got broken. Luke 4, And the devil said unto him, Jesus, All this power will I give you and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. The authority to rule this world that was meant for us, that was meant for you and for me, was handed over to Satan because of our sin. But it gets worse. We become slaves. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. The NIV translates it as a slave to sin. We were meant to rule. That's our identity. That's a God-given desire in all of us. We are fulfilled when we rule and reign. But now we are slaves to our own sin. That's the problem. But again, Jesus offers the solution. John 8, he said, just a few verses later, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Matthew, 18, uh, Matthew 28 says, Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All powers is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. There are three parts to this verse. First of all, Jesus took away the power and authority over this world from the devil. The devil was ruling this world until the day Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. And at that moment, all power and authority was handed to Jesus where it belonged in the first place. So the devil is no longer the ruler of this world. Now Jesus is. Then he sets us free from the bondage we were in. We are no longer slaves to the sin. Now we can be set free. Jesus offered all of us and he said, whatever bondage you're in, whatever addictions, whatever consequences of sin, whatever bad stuff, consequences our sin has, he said, I can set you free from all of it. And then we can rule again. He says, I have all authority, Jesus saying, I have all authority over all this world. Now you go and I'll share my authority with you. You rule this world again. You reign over this world again. And you do it with my, with Jesus' authority. Go into the world, teach, baptize. Jesus is with us all the time. We can rule the world together again with Jesus Christ. And what does the book of Revelation say about this? Revelation 20. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they shall need no lamp, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now these thousand years in the first verse, there are different ways of interpreting that. I personally believe that it's now. I believe these thousand years are a description between Jesus' first and second coming. Some people think this is in the future. It's besides the point. The point is, Jesus has already given us the authority to rule and reign with him now. And again, one day, it will be perfect. And we will reign with him forever. We can pray. We can proclaim God's truth to others. And we can rule and reign this world 
in Jesus' name. That's what is available to you and to me. And it's available today. Jesus has restored all of that. Let's look at the topic of good works. What happened there? Unto Adam he said, Because you have listened unto the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, curse is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return unto the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. We were created to work with God, and to enjoy our work with him, now work became a burden, became a necessity. God was saying, if you don't work, you will not survive. That's what the curse that we all lived under until Jesus came. Now let's look at that verse again, what he said. Same verse. Matthew 28. Go therefore, teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's our work now. That's what he wants us to do. Now, I can tell you from personal experience again, there's nothing more fulfilling than doing with our work what he wants us to do. Some of us, whether you're in ministry or just uh, by talking with friends, whatever, the most joyful moments in my life, like I said earlier, is when I knew that I knew that I knew that I just did what God wanted me to do. Sometimes it's praying, being in his presence. Sometimes it's helping someone who is in need. Sometimes it's maybe teaching or simply sharing Jesus, whatever. It's when we do that kind of work, when we do what God wants us to do, that we experience the greatest joy. Now, in the book of Philippians, it says something similar. Actually, Colossians. Colossians 3.22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartedly as to the Lord, and not unto man, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Do you see the difference now in Jesus? We don't have to work anymore to please people. We don't have to work anymore so that we get a paycheck at the end of the month and these kind of things. We don't have to work in our own strength any longer like Adam had to, to provide for ourselves. Now, whatever we do, we can do it with God and for God. In our workplace, in our family, in our relationships, whatever we do, we can simply do it with God and for God. Now, I don't see this as a command. Actually, I see this as something where I say, God is offering that to me. This is not something I have to do. But to me, this is something where I can say, look at this verse. God is offering me joy and meaning and purpose in whatever he asks me to do. All I have to do is doing it with him and doing it for his glory. Some of you know what I'm doing right now. I am working part-time as a programmer. I am obviously working here for Aletheia. I am um, having a lot to do with my family and three small kids and everything, so it gets crazy at times, and it is sometimes very exhausting. But I can tell you I love what I'm doing, and I love every single aspect of it because I'm doing it with God, and I'm doing it in His strength. Of course, there are bad days, I'm not saying that we will never have a day when we just feel like, I hate this. Those days will be there too. But overall, I can say, I find fulfillment and I can find joy because I'm doing it not for people, not for a paycheck, 
but I'm doing it for God. Meaningful work. Next, God created us for meaningful relationships. But those were also effective. Genesis 3, 7, the eyes of both of them, again, Adam and Eve, were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. 3.16 then says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to, to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, I don't want to talk too much about marriage today. Let's leave the men and women role out of this for the moment. But I think there's a more general meaning in all of this. And that is simply that of grasping and dominating We lost our identity. We lost our identity as children of God. We feel empty. We are looking for identity. And so what do we do? We compete. We fight with others. And we think that if I'm the greatest, if I'm the best, if I'm on the top, then I will be fulfilled. Then I will be someone. That's how this world works. That's how every aspect of this world works. And if I want to get up the ladder, what do I have to do? I have to climb over someone. Or even better, push him down the ladder so that he doesn't come after me. We, want, we are looking for identity. We are looking for meaning by, try, by competing with others. That's what happens without Jesus. But what happens in Jesus? He offered us his love. Again, I don't want to make this too much about marriage, but... What it says is simply, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What does that mean? What did God restore? If we are really fulfilled in Christ, and if we know our identity in Christ, we will be able to say, I don't need to step over other people. I'm already someone. I'm already fulfilled. I'm already secure in my identity in Christ. I don't need to impress other people. I don't need to step over others. I don't need to be on the top of that ladder. I don't need to be the best in this. I don't need to push others around and dominate them because I am content in Christ. I am a child of God. And it really doesn't matter if in this competition I'm first or second because my identity is in Christ. So we don't see the need anymore to fight with others. We can submit to others. And the other way around the same, we can love one another. Because suddenly other people are not my competitors any longer. Now other people are brothers and sisters in Christ. They are loved by God just as I am loved. God wants to have a relationship with them just as I have a relationship. And so now we can live a total different life. Instead of fighting with others, instead of grasping and climbing up the ladder and pushing others out of the way and all these things, now we can simply say, I love people. I'm totally fulfilled. And if someone else is better than me, it doesn't matter to me because I already have everything. I need. God's love and experiencing that love will change everything. And suddenly we don't have to dominate one another anymore and grasp and fight with each other for positions and for authority. If we have it in Christ, suddenly our relationships with one another have a total different dynamic. And people in the Bible were able to live exactly like that. Book of Acts, for example, says, all that belie- And all that believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and distributed them to all men as every man had need. And they continue, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their food with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as were being saved. Again, I don't see this so much as a command. I see this as something that is a natural outflow. 
if we truly live in a relationship with God and are fulfilled in Him, we will live in community and we will share life with one another. The Bible is full of descriptions what Christian fellowship is supposed to look like. Now, that doesn't mean that we all move in here tonight and then we share this apartment together. That's not the meaning. But what it does mean, we share life together and we love one another. God enables us to have these kind of lasting, meaningful relationships once again. Not like Adam and Eve who started fighting and hiding from each other. But we can now be transparent and vulnerable with one another again instead of fighting with each other. Relationships got restored. Next thing that got broken, safety and security. Genesis 3, 17, Unto Adam he said, Because you have listened unto the voice of your wife, have eaten of the tree of the, which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns, thistles shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat, eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return unto the ground. Out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Their security got broken. It was addressed specifically to Adam, certainly applied to Eve as well, applies to men and women. Our security is lost. Adam now had to provide for himself. But that was not God's design. We were never meant, we were never designed to carry all the responsibility of I have to provide for myself. And anybody who lives like this today eventually breaks down. We simply cannot cope with that pressure. We feel pressure, we feel burdened, we feel just exhausted all the time. But that's not God's design. So what's the solution? Philippians 4, 6-7 Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to, unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. For many years when I read this verse, I thought like, ha ha, nice fantasy. <laughs> Living like this it sounds kind of cool, but I can't do that. And I really thought this is a command that I simply cannot achieve. Until I understood this is not a command. I don't see it as a command. I see it as an offer. Because Jesus is saying, you can live like this. There's a part for you to play, and I'll do the rest. But you can live in peace and enjoy your whole life. Our part is not, no longer to provide for ourselves. Our part is prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. That's what Paul said we should do. That's the easy part. <coughs> if we do that, the verse says, God will take care of all our needs. Let's look at another passage that basically says the same thing. Matthew 6. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. It's not life more, more than food and the body than clothing. Behold the faults of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take your thought for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toll not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Next slide, please. Therefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? How shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Now here's where he's turning around. He says, You don't need to provide for yourselves. I'll do that. Here is your responsibility. Seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought of, of, the, of the things for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Same message as in the Philippian passage. Our job is no longer having to provide for ourselves. That was the consequence of sin. That was the truth for Adam, but not for us any longer. Our job is, let's seek God. Let's walk with him. Let's be obedient to him. And if we do that, God promised, I will take care of all your needs. Maybe not all our wants. He never promised that. But he did promise to take care of all our needs. Now we have a choice. We can say, okay, I'll walk with God. And if we do that, our fears, our insecurities, our burden of having to provide for ourselves, all these things will disappear. But if we say, I want to walk without God, I want to do it my own way, then all those fears, those insecurities, that pressure of having to provide for ourselves will come straight back on us. We choose and we reap the consequences one way or the other. God restored it again. So far we've been talking about this life, but let's learn a new side of the most important aspect of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Revelations 21, but the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and fornicators, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Have you ever sinned? I did. Without Jesus, that's our destiny. The lake of fire. Hell. Forever. So let's not just think about today. The message was a lot about this life and about what Jesus has restored for all of us already. But let's not lose sight. Ultimately, it's not about feeling secure in this life. Ultimately, it's not about provisions in this life or anything like that. Ultimately, this is about one of two possible destinies, heaven or hell. Jesus, thankfully, also has a solution for that. John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, in other words, doesn't have to go to hell, should not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, he will take us to heaven with him. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are worked in God. Ultimately, this is what Easter is really all about. It's not about having a good life here and now, even though that's a nice side effect of it. Ultimately, Easter offers us a way out from our certain destination. All we have to do is believing in Jesus, embracing him. Now let me go back to the beginning of the sermon. I said there are only two, three possibilities for Jesus' claim shared with you, the resurrection is an historically proven event. And Jesus claimed to be God. Now, if we come to the conclusion Jesus was evil or he was deluded, then of course, anything that I said today makes absolutely no sense and can be rejected. Then I'm lying, either lying to you, or I'm deceived by Jesus as well, one of the two, but really nothing I said today matters. But if he is God then Easter is so much more than just a historic event. Then it becomes personal. And then it requires a personal response. 
because he will determine our destiny. It's a choice each one of us has to make. We can choose to say, okay, I believe he was evil, he was lying. We can choose to say, I, be I believe he was crazy, he was out of his mind. That's a choice. But if you really come to the conclusion, Jesus is God, and that's why he, the resurrection happened, then let's deal with the consequence. And let's deal with the fact that then whatever he said is true, then we are all under the curse of sin. And only Jesus can rescue us from that curse. No one and nothing else. It requires a response. Let's skip one slide. So in conclusion, if Jesus is God, Easter is really so much more than just a historic event. Then Jesus offered to restore everything we are looking for. Everything that got broken by sin, he offers to us again today. Meaning, purpose, safety, security, meaningful relationships, all these things we talked about, they are all available again to you and to me. But most importantly, Jesus offered to ask, rescue us from our certain destination, which is hell, and offered to take us to heaven. If we really believe this, and if we really say, I believe that that is true, I'm sure we will live differently. I have to admit, I will live differently. A person who fully, 100% believes that in heart and mind will live differently than I live today. And if we don't really live the way we think we are supposed to live in light of this truth, then it probably shows something about our faith. And it probably shows something, an area of our lives, where we have not put our full trust in Jesus yet. So I want to encourage all of us in these next few days to really go to God and to really allow him to examine our hearts and to really ask him, am I truly living the way that you want me to live? Am I truly living the way that someone would live who 100% without any doubt, without any uncertainty, believes that Jesus has restored all these things that we talked about today? Let's spend some time this week reflecting on all of this and going deeper with God and allowing him to change our hearts and minds. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your awesome plan that you have for all of us. Thank you for the way you created us. And Lord, today we say we are sorry for the way our sin, our choice, our bad choices have distorted everything you have created. I'm sorry for the things that I have messed up that created a wrong image of who you are, that created wrong self-image, that created a wrong idea of how you see me and all these distortions that we deal with now. Lord, we don't want that any longer. And we don't want to embrace those things in our hearts any longer and carry them with us. But today is a day, Lord, when we say, set me free. Set us free. Restore us, Lord, in the fullness that you created us in the first place. And so, Lord, we pray that you will help us. Even right now and throughout this week. To really know your love for us. To really know your forgiveness. To really know your restoration. And to really know who we are in you now. And to walk in that freedom, to walk in that liberty, to walk, Lord, in that awesome freedom, in that awesome way that you have originally created us. Help us, Lord, to live like that. 
and help us, Lord, to embrace it. We will not be caught in sin any longer. We will not be caught in distortions any longer. But Lord, we will be able to live the kind of life that you want us to live. But ultimately, Lord, we thank you for the plan of salvation. And we thank you, Jesus, that you did what no one else in the whole universe could do. You rescued us from hell. And you offered us a way to heaven. So, Lord, we thank you for this. We give you glory for this. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will enable us to live the kind of life that you want us to live. Thank you, Jesus.